you're more likely to cut corners if you do it after the fact, in my opinion, versus paying attention to each take that's being recorded, making notes and doing it on the fly. And I'm gonna, we're going to get into how, how to actually do that. But I think the end result in most cases, if you, can, if, you, you know, if you know your way around the DAW, of course, the end result will be better if you do at least some of it on the fly and not have to do all of it after the fact, because you just probably won't. This is the Self-Recording Band Podcast. The show where we help you make exciting records on your own, wherever you are, DIY style. Let's go. Hello and welcome to the Self-Recording Band Podcast. I am your host, Benedict Hein. If you're new to the show, welcome. This is where we help you make better recordings from your jam space or wherever you are, basically. So you've come to the right place if you want to make better DIY recordings. If you are already a listener, welcome back. We really appreciate you. Today, we're going to talk about something that was actually requested inside our coaching community, the Self-Recording Syndicate. And we thought it's like a good podcast episode, or Malcolm actually thought that. (laughs) And I agree. So we talk about comping on the fly. And this is a topic that um, we, we're going to explain what comping actually means, but it, it, it's like it's a really helpful thing that you should know about. It saves you time in the process of making a record uh, later in the process after tracking. It gives you a better idea of the final product as you're tracking. Um, it helps you move fast and, and it avoids it helps avoid avoiding. It helps you avoid getting too close. That's what I'm trying to say <laughs> and losing perspective. <laughs> and it prevents, you know, recording unnecessary takes and wearing out the singers or performers. And it will ultimately lead to a better end result because you're not likely to cut corners in the process. So we're talking about that. It's basically getting the choosing the picking and choosing the best takes while you're recording, doing some small edits as you go instead of doing it all after the fact. And we're going to explain to you how to do that. Go a little deeper on like why that's worth it uh, and share some of the tools and techniques and, and skills you need in order to pull it off. So as always, this episode is on YouTube and on your favorite podcast platforms like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you enjoy podcasts. And I'm doing this with my friend and co-host, Malcolm Owen Flood. Hello, Malcolm. How are you? Hey, Benny. I'm great, man. How are you doing? I'm doing great as well. Had a great weekend. Fantastic. Snowboarding again yeah. with the kids. So... Oh. That's awesome. Yeah, <laughs> really awesome. The, for the first time, they made it down the entire hill that where we were snowboarding, like without falling. They didn't really do Sweet. like you know turns and stuff. They just stood up and went, <laughs> and I was like terrified. Yeah. <laughs> but they made it all the way down, and it was awesome. awesome. And so yeah, pretty cool. <laughs> that's so fun. We actually had snow here as well, so that's rad. That's right. you had yeah. Hey, did you see? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, go ahead, buddy. Go ahead. No, no I just wanted to uh, say that I wanted to ask, like, yeah, uh, if, if there is, like, actual snow. Because Richie, you know, who we both know, who's also a member of our of our community and a longtime listener, he's, he lives close to you or relatively close to you on the same island, at least. <laughs> and uh, he sent me pictures a while ago of, like, snowy hills and stuff. And it's hard for me to imagine that after being there. And, like, but, yeah. Right. Yeah, you were here for the, the gorgeous summer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I actually, have but snow it does right get now. snowy. All right. All right. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, not much, honestly. It's it's not not hindering us in any way, but there is some snow. It looks nice for awesome. sure. Awesome. Did you see the new Kemper? There's a new Kemper? <laughs> There's a so the answer is no. Kemper, I should say. Not oh. new Kemper. New Kemper is a loaded thing because it's not yeah. a Kemper 2, but it's like a Kemper stomp. Uh, it's called the Kemper. Let me think what it's called. It's called the, it's called the Kemper Player. Oh, yeah. And yeah. It's, it's, I know yeah, what you mean. It's like a little tiny camper they can't profile or anything it just can hold the sounds yeah um but it looks rad i'm trying to decide if i want to sell my big big camper because i don't think i'll ever be profiling an amp again honestly <laughs> so it's just <laughs> may as well have something for gigging and jamming yeah, yeah i can't decide yet <laughs> yeah so it looks pretty cool i'm still like that transition was a little rough there i thought it was something about snow and because you were so fast and then you transitioned to the camper so it took me a while to realize what, uh, yeah. what you're asking like what has this camper to do with snow but yeah uh, the camper's great and uh, the new thing that they released yeah I've, I've had a look at it and it sounds like a like a fun solution for sure if you already have the profiles and i i, I honestly think most people never really got into profiling themselves anyway so totally. i think yeah that's totally fine yeah I think for yeah ninety nine percent of people, uh, just something that has good sounds you can load good sounds onto is going to be better. But it's so rad that something like that's available now. Yeah, guitar amps have gotten so good. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And it is it is you still need an amp though, right? It's it's like a passive thing. It doesn't have a power amp or something, does it? No power no, amp. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. you're correct. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Still, so great. Yeah, 
Awesome. So what did you do this weekend? Check this camper out or what was your thing? I mean, I looked at it online and stuff like that, but no, <laughs> okay. no, it's just... <laughs> but I actually went to, I hung out at a recording studio though. I did go down to Silverside Sound oh, down great. the road, which is a, a beautiful studio just next to me. And uh, yeah, we, we hung out there. There was a session going on. I was playing with a camera though. I wasn't recording. <laughs> yeah. It was on the other side of it this time. Yeah. But it was fun being back in the studio for a full band session, checking all that out. It was good. All right, great. That sounds like fun. Yeah, I saw actually I saw a live recording, a live video of of a pretty cool sort of punk emo <clears throat> kind of sort of band. What was their name? P- Poor Sport. Poor Sports. Is that a thing? Oh yeah, I yep. think yeah. I yep. saw I yep. saw Poor Sports. Poor Sport. Yeah, good band. I, I saw a live video that they did. I think at Silverside Sound, if I'm correct. I think it yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I totally know what you're talking about. I saw that too. Yeah, that yeah, was pretty rad. A great band. Good guys. Yeah, that was a pretty cool, uh, like actually pretty good performance, and also a pretty great looking video and all around great thing. I, I think Derek Madden, our, our our friend, shared this, and um, cool. I saw it, and it was was pretty cool. So shout out to that band and that studio. <laughs> Gonna put yeah, the link to that in the, show notes, in the show notes. Very tight band. They're good. Yeah. <laughs> For sure, and it, it's it's very much my thing. I instantly added it to my Spotify, to various Spotify playlists because I really enjoyed them. <laughs> oh, awesome! Awesome! I'll let them know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, do that, do that. Great. All right, so um, back to recording stuff, or back to like the the whole topic of recording, and specifically comping this time. So we should probably start by telling people what comping actually is, because we don't expect you to to know that, and we're here to explain it. So. What does it do? Yeah, yeah. So comping. Comping is the act of selecting the best bits of different performances, different takes, and making them into a super take. You're compiling the different performances into a performance that somebody can listen to then. So vocals are the most common example of when you would be doing some comping is, you know, the person might sing the song front to back three times or something, or or depend you can go as granular as you want to start just doing section by section and you probably will but the ultimately you end up with all of these different performances and you have to go through and select comp is what we'd call that the performance together and just choose the best sections and cut it all together so that nobody can tell it was cut together but you end up with the best result you can from those performances that is comping in a nutshell it is, absolutely. So, and there's two ways to do that. You can do that as you record, like during the session. You can record and at the same time pretty much pick the, the sections you want to keep and create your sort of master take that's going to be the final take. Or you can just record take after take after take and then afterwards go through it and then piece together your final performance, right? And if yeah. you, if, in case yeah. you're wondering, like, why would I even do that? Like, isn't it a thing to just record a song start to finish? Because I know that a lot of people think that's the way you do it and I understand why they think that. It is totally common and normal to do it that way, to like piece together the performance. This is not something bad or like a, you know, it's not cheating or anything like that. Even the best performers in the world do that. If you can pull it off to just record one take, then awesome, good for you, but you don't have to do it. It's totally mm-hmm. fine to just focus on a verse or even just a part of it, even sometimes, you know, doing individual, like a few couple of few words or whatever. Like, So that's totally, totally normal. And uh, yeah. I'm just I'm just saying because it, it, I know that a lot of people no, would be like, you're right. yeah, why would I? Why wouldn't I just sing the song start to finish or play the song start to finish? And um, I'm I'm glad you brought that up because like if a lot of people do think, well, you just have to nail it kind of thing. And I mean, if you want to hold yourself to that, it, sure, but it doesn't help the result in my opinion. It actually like even just as a musician knowing that hey, if I screw up, I don't need to stop. I can just keep playing, and we'll grab that little one bit that I messed up from a different take. That just is going to let me not get hung up on the the details that don't matter. It can let off pressure from the band a lot. And another thing that I think some people maybe don't know is that you can totally comp live, like live band performances as well. Like if you are tracking and there's bleed and stuff, you can still pull off comping in those situations. You can still comp even if you aren't using a metronome. It's harder and not as successful, but you can still comp things together in that format too. Comping can be done pretty much in every format. And while digital audio workstations, your your DAW that you're using to record has made this a lot easier and we're going to get into the how later. This has been happening since the days of tape as well. They were literally cutting and splicing tape together to make this happen. So it's like timeless tactic used by audio engineers 
And uh, it's actually kind of a skill that makes somebody an audio engineer because it is kind of something that separates somebody that's not <laughs> from somebody that is, is the ability to comp. Absolutely, 100%. And yeah, let's go into like those two approaches and the pros and cons to each. I honestly mm -hmm. don't think there's a lot of, I personally don't think there's a lot of pros to doing it after the fact, other than maybe it makes the, the actual session a little less stressful if you don't know what, what you're doing. Um, so I can see that. Right. If you're not really, you know, in, if, if it's not really intuitive for you to navigate the DAW and do all of that, you might not be able to focus on the performances and, and would rather do that and then do the comping after the fact. I can see that. But once you get to a certain level, of skill using your DAW, I think there's more pro pros than cons to doing it on the fly, actually. Or to doing at least, you don't have yeah. to completely finish it, but to get it pretty far, at least, on the fly. I think there's a lot of yeah, pros to it, that. I'm in the same camp. And just to make it simple for our listeners, there's, yeah, comp on the fly, and then there's the comp in after the fact, which... I think Benny and I both refer to as comp diving. I could be yeah. wrong about that, but that's what I, I call it, I, comp diving, because yeah. you end up clicking like the button that reveals all of the different takes that you've done, and it's just this huge accordion of takes, and you're like, oh man, I gotta listen to 36 of these to find the best one. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, uh, it's overwhelming after yeah. a, a heavy day of overdubs. Um, yeah. <laughs> and yeah, it, it can be a bit much. Yeah. Um, but, but starting with the the comp diving, which would be the doing it after the fact, um, the 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 only pros that I can really think of are that you keep the momentum of the session going. You're like, hey, just play it again, play it again. Okay, I think we're good. Let's just move on. Let's play the next part. Whatever you know, you're just keeping audio happening. You're you're playing as much as possible without any interruptions. Ideally, yeah, that's kind of the pro. And and can I think of one more? You don't have to do the comp under the pressure mm. of the artist there. Like, there's a little bit of a, you might feel better about it if you're the one doing the comp. Mm. When you're doing it later, alone, you know, <laughs> yeah. you might kind of like, kind of get into a, 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 a vibe there and, and maybe be a more confident making decisions without like other people over your shoulder. Maybe there's a pro there. But I think to both of those, and those are honestly the only things I could try and argue for comp diving once you get good enough at comping on the fly you kind of get both of those benefits back anyways in my opinion you do because once you get good at comping on the fly it pretty much happens in real time like it it doesn't slow you down and you are making the decisions kind of without telling the artist because you're, you're they're just singing the next part they don't even know that you've already comped the parts before and then when they walk out of the vocal booth, for example, you're just going to cl click play and be like, check it out. You did it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that that's an ideal situation. But like the, yeah, well, there's, you could argue there's some pros for the comp diving. It's kind of like, as soon as you get good at comping on the fly, they, they become evened out. Yes. 100% agreed. And one thing you said there in the beginning where you said like, okay, now I've got these 36 tracks that I have to listen through. The reality is, if you're being honest, you probably won't do that. Most people won't yeah. listen to the entire thing. You will listen to a couple and then be like, well, let's just go with this one because, you know, I can always fix it or whatever. I don't have the bandwidth to listen to all of these anyway. And so you might not <laughs> even listen to the best take, you know. And so you, the, the, you're more likely to cut corners if you do it after the fact, in my opinion, versus paying attention to each take that's being recorded, making notes and doing it on the fly. And I'm gonna, we're going to get into how, how to actually do that. But I think the end result in most cases, if you can, if you you know, if you know your way around the DAW, of course, the end result will be better if you do at least some of it on the fly and not have to do all of it after the fact because you just probably won't. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, maybe pros for, for comping on the fly is that when you are done, you know you're done because you can actually listen to the comp and the singer can confidently be like, okay, I'm, I don't have to worry about this anymore. I can crack a beer. I can start drinking milk again, whatever yeah. they yeah. weren't allowing themselves to do. <laughs> and, and like, or if, because vocals are the easy example, but let's say we're do, comping drums on the fly. Now the drummer can strike their kit. So while you're just finishing the, like, you know, finishing up the comp or just doing a final polish on that, they can be striking their drums so that you're ready to move on to recording bass or whatever, you know, like, it's going to free up that time and you're going to have the confidence to be saying, no, we're done. Let's move on to the next thing. You don't have to then be like, oh, we're not done. We have to set up that chain again and never, it never works. Yes. So th that's a huge pro for comping on the fly. 
Yeah, 100%. So also I think that the less time you have to spend with your raw recordings or with, with the, the yeah the source tracks that you're recording, the better because it it keeps it you know you, you're gonna be very close to it anyways. And the more the more you hear it, the more time you spend with it, the less objective you're gonna be when it comes time to mix and or do any other things later. So I think mm-hmm. it's not a good idea to even have to have that session after the fact where you have to listen through it. Like, you know 50 times it's way better to do it in the session and then after when that's done you can just move on to the next thing like you just said Malcolm so it's it's I think it keeps you fresh it helps avoid getting too close to it too early and then yeah and also it prevents like unnecessary takes so sometimes you know if you're just recording and you're just guessing then you might want to you might make your singer do like three extra takes just to be safe because you're not really sure if you got everything and if you can actually comp something together so you say like let's do five more or whatever and then we'll probably have enough whereas if you pay attention do it on the fly check if it works and then if it works just commit you can be like you can confidently say okay that's it we're done and you might save you know a couple of takes actually and and not wear the singer out and so yeah absolutely yeah for singers especially i think comping on the fly couldn't be more crucial because while it seems more efficient just to keep rolling take after take after take you end up doing redundant takes that you didn't need to do yeah because you're like well i we did five of the intro so we might as well do five of the verse you know it's like well they got it on the first one why why are you doing it again just just move on yeah and and that momentum of being like, hey, you just nailed that. Let's go to the course. Like that gets you better takes. Yeah, winning, letting the the, the musician know that they're winning and crushing it is going to accelerate things even more. Totally. Speaking of momentum, another pro is like it gives you a better idea of the final product. I think it's always so much fun during a session to to be like, well, things are coming together. Like I already hear the final thing. It's exciting, right? I don't hear to a bunch of like raw takes and every time I hit play, I have to explain to everyone in the room, well, this is not the final thing. We have to do this and that. Like it's way cooler to be able to hit play and every time you do that, you hear something that is exciting and awesome and every single take you add is like getting you closer to the final thing. That's a way better way of working in my opinion. And so I always like to have that. That's also the reason why I kind of mix on the fly, even though I might undo these decisions, but I always make the rough mix sound good as we go just just it's Absolutely. it's so much more fun to have it close to the final thing or you know and the more advanced you get the more you commit like it's not th- these days if i track something i probably don't even mix that much in the daw as i go but i'll just commit the source tones i'll just record through whatever i think is necessary and and, and capture great sounding stuff because i have yeah. the confidence to do so so but I, I just think in general if you can after recording if the, the person comes back to the control room and you hit play and it sounds close to finished it's an awesome feeling and everyone's going to be more excited about the record 100 percent, yeah i think it was chris lord algae who's probably the most famous mixer ever told his brother tom lord algae when he gave him a job yeah. <laughs> like a, kind of a big break i think with like green day yeah. or something crazy <laughs> yeah. who, uh, that he like he was like no big deal it's really easy but every time you click play it should sound like the finished record something along the lines yeah. paraphrasing for sure yeah. but but it's kind of like totally true. It's just like, why would it not sound right when you play it back? So there's no reason to have uh, a vocal line in there that you don't know is good. Like it's just going to distract, the singer's just going to start hating it and be stressed out that it all sounds like that. So you kind yeah. of actually have to be really careful, in my opinion, to yeah. only play stuff that sounds good. Yeah, that's another thing too. Well, I didn't even think of that, but you're totally right. Sometimes if there is a certain thing that you keep playing back that annoys the, the performer, uh, even if you fix it later, they might still hear that just because they heard it so often and got used to it. Or the, the fear is there that it still might be there somewhere. So yeah, don't make them get used to the mistakes. Like play them back stuff that they enjoy. It's, it's, yeah. yeah, that's going to come up again in the how section. Yeah, I've got, exa- yeah. yeah thoughts on that cool, for sure. Cool, that, great. That's definitely a really good point. Great. Yeah, let's get um, to that actually. So what is required to pull yeah. that off? I think the first thing is... As we said a couple of times now, know your basic editing tools and shortcuts, mm-hmm. you know, to to use all those tools in your DAW. So this is really just a few things. So the, the, all the DAWs differ a little bit there, how, how you actually do it. But like the few things you always need is you got to have something like, you know, scissors, a way to cut the, 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 the event, the audio track, whatever. You have to know how to do that quickly. You have to know how to move events or I just call them events now. They're called differently in different DAWs, like the clips or whatever you want to call them, the stuff with the waveform in it. You know how to, you have to know how to move that back and forth or like snap it to the grid, you know, move it without snapping, these types of things. And then you know, have to know how to piece it back together, apply fades, 
That's basically it. Like cut, move, put together, add a fade that it doesn't do any weird cl- clicks and stuff. And those are the things you need to know how to do. And you need to know how to do it very quickly, ideally without even have to, having to look at your keyboard. Just, you know, mm. doing it. Yep. Agreed. Yeah, it's it does take a certain amount of like skill yeah <laughs> with your DAW like you should have a, a pretty good grasp on it like you said know the basic editing tools but then also like know your hotkeys because if it takes you three minutes to slide a vocal take up to the your comp track like it, that's slowing you down too much and yeah then you should probably do it after the fact because you're just not able to comp on the fly yeah totally but yeah, okay, no, 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 keep going. That, that, <laughs> no. that big buck can wait. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, yeah, the other thing is the actual comping feature. So what I mean by that is, you, depending on which DAW you're using, if you're using any of the major ones, the full versions like Pro Tools, Cubase, Logic, Reaper, all of these have a comping feature. Reaper, I think, just added it not too long ago because people got all excited, and it was one of those things where I'm like, yeah, Cubase does, has been doing that for a decade. But <laughs> anyway, it's like... It, it, it instead of having to record on multiple tracks and then moving it all to like that one master comp track that you just said, Malcolm, there is a comping feature built into these DAWs where you record on the same track over and over again, and it creates these invisible layers underneath what you're seeing, and you can like either collapse that or open that up, and then you have in Pro Tools I think it's called a playlist if I'm not wrong, exactly. and then in 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 Cubase they call it. Subtracks or something. I don't. I don't even know what the what they call it. But like, there's a button. You click it, and then it expands the the track, and then you see all those takes underneath underneath each other, and like all lined up. So you can even do a loop recording, and it will just add take after take after take. And then you can just mark certain sections of each take, and it will automatically appear. Those marked tracks will automatically appear at the top on the actual like sort of master track, whatever you want to call that. And you can create your comp easily by just, you know, just like grabbing a marker, marking the sections that you like, and they will appear at the top. And you can even set it so that it automatically adds fades in the background. And you can quickly comp your track together like that with the comping feature. So with with that, you don't have to have multiple tracks. You can do it all on one track, select the sections you like. And then once you have your comp and you listen through it and you like it the way it is, you can commit and get rid of all the, the junk, basically. So that's... Yep. the comping feature. And it pretty much works the same way in all these DAWs. If you don't have that feature because you're, you're on a light version or a different DAW that ha- doesn't have that, there's still a way to pull it off though. And I think you have actually a workflow, Malcolm, where it's kind of in between, right? You have that manual comp track, if I remember correctly, despite having the yep. playlist. So you might want to explain how you do it because I always just use the comping feature in Cubase. Yeah, yeah, totally. And there, there's no wrong answer here. It's just kind of figure out the workflow that works for you. And every once in a while, I'll do, I do change it based on the client I'm working with or the instrument I'm working with. So what I like to do, well, well first, you described the comp feature. And then, yeah, the alternative, I just want to kind of give a, a brief overview of what that really actually looks like so people grasp both. Um, and manually doing like a comp on the fly is just having like an empty track and then you're going through the different takes you did, still using that playlist view that Benny just described, but then finding like the section you want, Command C for copy, go up, click on that same spot, you know, not moving the alignment of your cursor and the timing of the session on that blank track, and then paste in it there. And then you're just going to copy and paste and build it that way. That's kind of like the manual approach. Whereas Benny's approach, you just highlight it and it appears up on there. It's just kind of done for you. Um, depending on the DAW, there might be like a hotkey or a button you have to press, but it just kind of like shoots it all up there. And you can just, while you're in that playlist view, you can audition each take if you need to refresh. But but yeah, those are kind of like the two comp on the fly methods. And I like to have that empty track, like a, a, a separate audio file or a separate audio track, I should say, floating above the track that I'm recording on. I call it like a, a tracking track track and then like a comp track and the reason i like that is because i can i (laughs) i can kind of i mean there's there's multiple reasons sometimes i'll have different monitoring like effects on the comp Mm -hmm. track so Mm because the singer Mm -hmm. only wants to hear stuff like certain like doesn't want any effects or something Mm -hmm. on like their track what they're monitoring but when we listen back we want to hear it cut in there it also makes pre and post roll really easy because that comp track uh, that I'm copying the good stuff onto has all the good stuff. So they hear and they're singing along with the stuff that they just nailed and then it punches in onto this other track. And you can also do that 
on the like with Benny's method too. This just kind of works really easily in in Pro Tools. But another thing I like about this method is that I can repeat that comp track and I can copy up like second best takes yep. <laughs> and third best takes, yep. you know? And then I have this little like quick audition. So the singer's like, oh, I don't like the one you chose there. I'm like, no, no problem. I just mute that clip and go to the track above it and unmute it. And it's like, there was my second choice ready to play in it all. Yeah. It, it's kind of seamless like that. And then if they like it, I'll just drag it down onto the next one. So you can see how there's like so many different ways you could do this. But like I, I use this method most when I know that I want to have options available, yeah. I guess. Yeah, you're totally right. And now that you say that, I actually do variations of that as well, depending on the situation. So what I, for example, what I like to do is, even if I don't record onto a separate track, what I sometimes do is I record on my one sort of comp track, but I will duplicate it and um, not record on the duplicate, but arm the monitoring, like on the, like turn on the monitoring on the duplicate. And so they will listen to that duplicate thing but it's recorded to different track which allows me to do the overlap thing that you just said where you hear the, yeah. the previous section without me having to create the punch in points and stuff like that you know it's very easy to just and also yeah. i don't have to mute and unmute that thing all the time it's just one monitor track that's on all the time and the other one is just not on and and so that way i don't have to switch back and forth so, so that alone is worth it often and so so yeah i do variations of that as well and you'll figure out your own work for a flow i think once you get you wrap your head around this absolutely yeah and different instruments will have different preferences for you yeah. as well yeah um, like drums i don't do this because i don't want to have like another oh, like God, no. 18 tracks <laughs> yeah. of empty like that i got to copy onto i'll just comp you know using benny's yeah. described method of using the comp features that's the, the quickest way for that um, but for guitars i like the comping track thing and vocals i tend to as well yeah. Good thing, though, you brought up the drums, because one thing we absolutely need to mention is whenever you're doing comping with multi-track recordings, could be multiple mics on a guitar amp or a full drum kit, make sure before you start recording or comping or anything that you group those tracks together and you lock the... There's a different feature probably in different DAWs, but you have to lock the phase, phase relationships between those tracks and make sure that when you apply, when you do a comp, that it applies it exactly the same way to all of those tracks. So in Cubase, for example, if you don't hit that button and you, you start to make a comp and you accidentally don't highlight one of the tracks, then you might comp, you know, 15 out of the 16, but one you're going to miss and then you're going to create a mess and it all will just never work <laughs> oh, again. Yeah. So you have to make sure that the phase relationship stays the same and that whatever you do to one track will also automatically be applied to all the others. That is a, a, an absolute must. Well, others yep. of the, that related of that, instrument. Yeah, of that or, related or, instrument, or, yeah, exactly. performance, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that definitely 100% necessary. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, good, good Good. point. And yeah. yeah, you'll have to look into your own DAW for how that works. Yeah. Uh, it's just handled differently between them. Yeah. Yeah, now, one thing that's really important is that you keep track of your takes outside of the DAW as well. At least I think this is really important. So what I mean by that is that you're taking notes, essentially. That's really what it boils yeah. down to. If you've got an amazing vault of a memory and you can do it that way, that works, I guess. But I like a pen and paper yeah. to, to go through it with. And that is just me taking notes of which parts of the performance I like. So if they're doing like a front to, like a start to finish performance of the vocals, let's just pretend, I'll be like verse one, zero three, that's like take three, you know, and then circle that. I've got like a whole little matrix and nobody else would ever be able to understand, but it makes sense to me yeah. <laughs> for how I can like, because you don't have time to be like, oh, when they said that word, it was quite good. Yeah. You, know, you just have to like <laughs> yeah. have like, because it's in real time. So I'm like three circle, three circle star. And yeah. like I have the, and then I can look at this and just be like, okay, take three was good here. The next line was take four. And then I can piece it all together that way. And that's going to let you both like because we're comping on the fly that's yeah. the idea and definitely do this if you're not comping on the fly definitely definitely do this because yeah. you don't want to listen to all 18 takes you just want to listen to number three and four the ones that had got circled you know or like whatever your system yeah. is but if you're comping on the fly this is still valuable because what if you play it back and then the singer's like oh i really don't like 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 the line there and you're like okay well that's okay i also circled number four so i'm going to pull up and take four now instead of three, which was in there. Yeah. And then you you know that that one's going to be pretty good as well. And then you don't have to like be like, okay, let's start at the beginning. Here's your first take. Yeah. Oh, that was bad. Yeah. <laughs> Number two. Oh, still pretty bad, man. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like it. That was like that for years before I figured that out, man. That was exactly too, how man. I communicated with singers in the first five years of my career or whatever, which is so terrible. But yeah. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> yeah. yeah. So yeah, you, you, it speeds up both of your yeah. the, the time for everyone. Just knowing which takes were good and having those backup options available, right? So that's that's a no brainer. Still have some kind of way of keeping track of what is good and what is not good so that you can make your life easier if you have to do more comping after the fact or if somebody requests a change from what you went with. Yeah, totally. Also, um, like we said, avoid playing the bad stuff back to them too many times, which means I would also mm -hmm. make, I don't know if you do that too, but I would also make notes of the takes that are absolutely not going to cut it. So there's a mistake, they're saying the wrong word or something was just clearly off. I will be like, nope, that's definitely not it. And I will get rid of it as fast as I can. Just so I, because I yeah. don't want to play back that stuff over and over again or accidentally listen to it if I clearly oh, know it's trash, dude. right? And so... Yeah, yeah. I, I, I didn't do that. I wish I did. That's a, it's a really good note. I should have just like X'd it on my, yeah. my notes kind of thing. Yeah. But what I would do... I try to do, and I don't think I was strict enough about that, is just undo the recording. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> just be like, no, that one didn't happen. And then the, I can't listen to it again. But the, the trouble with that is that sometimes there is good within the bad. Yes. So it's all good until they screwed up the word. You know, and you don't want to lose that. That might have, that might save you. So yeah, it, your method's a really good idea. Yeah, yeah. So exactly. So I want to keep it, but I want to mark it as like not good. And if we really can find something awesome in the other takes, I'm, I can still go back to that bad take and find a good thing or whatever. Like, or, or they might tell me, hey, uh, I really liked how I sang this one part here, and I'm, and even if I marked it as the bad take, I can still go in and grab that one clip that yeah, they really enjoyed or still something, there. you know. So, but yeah, make notes. It's absolutely critical, and especially if you if you're not at the point where you feel like you can do it on the fly. If you do it afterwards, definitely make notes so you don't have to go through everything, but you have like a, a selection um, that you can start with, uh, and that like yeah, just for obvious reasons. Great. Yeah. Good. Um, I will. I, I also think that there is a sort of a hybrid approach. If you're not fast or in, or you know fast enough, skilled enough to do it while the the person's in the room, you can maybe just focus on the performance fully, make notes as they go, record a bunch of takes, and then they will gonna need they're gonna need breaks anyway in between, and so there will be time probably in between takes, in between whatever that you can use to then quickly look at your notes, do a bit of comping until they come back, and then you at least did it in the session, not necessarily as you're going, but sometime in the session, you don't have to do it afterwards and you're still making progress. Yep. So of course you need breaks as well, but probably the singer or whoever's playing, they will need breaks more frequently and then you breaks. can use these, you know, when they go to the bathroom, maybe you can quickly choose a couple of lines and then you have made progress and so you don't have to do it at the same time. If that helps, that's kind of yeah. a hybrid thing. I would do both. I would do a lot of things as we go just because I can do it. But then also if they need a break or whatever, I will still improve it even more just to make progress and to move, you know, yeah. move on. Yeah, so. totally. Like guitars and bass, I track 100% as I go. Yeah. Like, all right, comp 100% as I go. Like by the time we move on to the next part, yeah. the last one's already yeah. edited pretty yeah. much. Yeah. Like, or close to. Like yeah. it's, it's kind of like, it's easy. You just it, it's really easy to do those in bite sized chunks, you know. Yes. So it's like okay, that's done. Move on. Really? Vocals is harder though because like it is way more dynamic. Sometimes the comps might not go well together because of those dynamic changes and tonal changes of the singer. So that can be tricky. The words can be attached to each other, so it's not as simple as just saying, "Hey, you said that word nice on this one, but the next word is good or was bad." Let's just combine those two because if they're attached, like if the the words blend into each other, you might not be able to take those and shove them together without it sounding like an edit. So it's not totally as easy to comp on the fly to its entirety, but you can still get the rough the rough chunks put in. So, okay, this was overall the best first stanza of the first verse and then the second stanza of the first verse and get that rough comp done on the fly. And then after you finished vocals, you're like, all right, go have a drink of water and relax on the couch outside. Okay, now I'm going to dive in and be like, okay, that word, I got to go to the other, you know, highlighted best takes and see if we got that word better on that comp and do a, you know, a tighter comp from there. For sure. Yeah, 100%. Um, and also ha having notes helps there because what you also don't want to do is with them, you don't want to, with them in the room, you don't want to, you know, spend too much time trial and error, you know, without trial and error things and like listen to a bunch of takes and, and, and you want to be fast and efficient and you want to make them feel good. And if they have to sit through you, you know, going through all these things and, and, and taking an hour to, to do some minor edits, that's not the way to do it. So you have to be fast. You have to have notes and you can do it yep. while they take a break, but it will also don't take forever and make them insecure about the performance. So absolutely. Yeah. 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 Really good note. Cool. Go ahead. Is, mm -hmm. is there anything you don't comp on the fly? 
Not, not really, I think. Honestly, All right. not really. I mean, there is with drums. It takes a little longer just because of the of the amount of tracks, and then also the all the stuff that I listen to. So with drums, I listen to various things. I can only focus on so much. So with drums, I might listen to how consistent the kick is, how consistent the snare is, the overall timing and feel. Of course, if there's any sort of flams in between certain things that yeah. I can't really fix afterwards, like all kinds of things, then I have to watch all these levels. And there's just so much to 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 monitor and to do while doing drums that I usually just listen and look at the screen while they play. But I will still make notes and then I will I can pretty quickly once the take is done open up all those lanes pick a section move it up or whatever and, and I still kind of do it but it's a little slower than just having one thing to focus on for me so yeah yeah I drums are the only one that's really different for me too drums in general I'm I mean I'm more in rock than like yeah. metal so it's less exact yeah like than than like metal is often there's a lot of changes being made you know, we're experimenting with parts. So we're looking at drums as like a whole start to finish performance usually for me yeah. rather than something we punch in, which I punch in every other instrument pretty heavily. With drums, it's kind of like if I got a good studio drummer, it's we're, we're going to play the whole song through. We're going to tweak the parts a little bit if we need to. And then we're going to play the whole song through like three or four times. And then that's all I'm going to need. And while I'll, I'll definitely make notes as that's playing, be like, okay, you nailed the, the verse here, you nailed the chorus here. And then it's like, you know, four edits later, that's the comp, you know, yeah. just like chunk, 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 and we're probably done, yes. you know, but I'm doing that after the fact, after we've played it like four times pretty much. So I, I guess drums are the only one that I, I comp dive on, but because I'm working with such a good session drummer, it's like not a lot of tracks. Yeah, yeah <laughs> totally. And, and also the thing is with most other things, maybe with the exception of vocals, but guitars, as you said, and a few other things, once the comping's done, the editing's almost also done, assuming that you have yeah. good drum tracks to play to that have been edited before you add the other instruments, which is highly recommended. Yeah. And so f for those things, like, yeah, when the recording's done, the comping's done, then the editing's pretty much also done. With drums, it's like there's going to be a comp and it's going to be great, but the, the, there's going to be some more detailed editing after the fact just because I want to really make sure that the groove is tight. I, I might have to quantize things. I might have to fix a fill here and there. There's just so many transients, so many hits, so many things to fix that. And it's the foundation for everything else that there's always this extra step required anyways. So that's why the drum comp doesn't have to be perfect right away. I just need to know that it's good enough so that I, I can edit it without artifacts. That's the one thing I look for with drums. It's like... With a good drummer, you don't have that problem, really. But the reality is with many, yeah. many drummers, you have to make sure that they are close enough that if you have to move a hit or if you have to fix a fill or whatever, that it's it's close enough that you can do it without an artifact. And there, yeah. you, you just know with experience that there are certain things you can't really fix. For example, if a kick and a snare are happening at the same time, but there's a slight flam that you don't want, very hard to fix that oftentimes. Um, but yeah. if, the, the, if the thing is together, but both are like pretty late, that's fixable. So there's... You know, certain things that I just listen for with drums and I just know what can and can't be done, but I don't necessarily do it all as I go. So, yeah, <clears throat> that, isn't it funny that <laughs> the four on the floor, yeah, the hardest thing to do is like the hardest yeah. beat. To <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's, it's the simplest thing and it's so overdone, yeah. but like for drummers to nail that, it's like yeah. so rare. <laughs> I had so many people tell me over the course of my career, like, I don't know what, you know, people would tell me like, I don't know why everyone's like raving about, you know, ACDC drums or whatever. It's the simplest thing in the world. Like everyone can play that. And I'm like, go sit down and try to play back in black like that. Like no way you can pull yeah, that off. Yeah. Like, And then it's like, zoom in on how yeah. unaligned your kick and snare are. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like, it's just so hard to pull that off in a really great way. Yeah, totally. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like the yeah, longer, yeah, the more time you have in between hits, the harder it is to get right. Like if it's just very busy, you just can't tell some of the, the detail. But if like, if there's enough room, it, it's, it gets harder and harder to really nail that. So Absolutely. Yeah. 100% agree. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, it comes with experience. A lot of this comes with experience, actually. Just ha you gain this intuition on what you can and can't fix and, and how to handle the momentum of the artist in front of you as well. You know, so adjusting your comping to suit who you're working with is another thing that will become intuitive yeah. as you develop the skills to do it as well. Totally. Totally. And one more skill I have on my list here that I think is is really critical. And is, this is to learn, you need to learn how to listen for the right things. So 
I'd mm. say when I'm comping and when I make decisions of like what what's going to stay and what's going to be cut out, I listen for feel and emotion, especially with vocals, more than I listen for like technical perfection. So there are some exceptions. So let's say guitar tuning. It, it's got to be right, right? There's no Because it's so hard or almost impossible to fix. So with guitars, I, yep. I very much listen for perfection in terms of tuning. Maybe not in terms of timing, but definitely in terms of tuning. With vocals, it's different. With vocals, I listen to... Does that feel right? Does it have the right vibe? And like, yeah, it's hard to describe in words. It's just, you know when it's right and you know when it's not. And it's not the intonation. It's not the timing because that stuff can be easily fixed if it's not too far off, right? But sometimes I have a take that's perfect theoretically where like the timing's spot on, the intonation's spot on, but it just doesn't speak to me. And then there might be another take where something about it is just exactly right and it gives me goosebumps, but it might not be mm -hmm. perfect. So I, you have to learn to listen for those things and then pick the take that feels better. And if it's like slightly off, you can always fix that. So that's a thing you need to, to learn, I think, how to, how to yeah, listen for those things, especially with vocals. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, that's a great, great note. Yeah. This video, or sorry, this podcast. It is a video. Which, yeah, it is a video. You can watch it. But it, what I'm saying is that while we can describe what comping is and good approaches to it, to then implement it, like there's an extra step for this podcast and is you actually learning how to do it in your own DAW because it's, it is different in each DAW. So there's a, you, you know, it requires a deeper look. <laughs> yeah. If you're, and if you're not understanding us at all, it's worth looking up because this might change how much you hate recording. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's because a good way to put it. If, like it's so front, like, oh man, I just had no idea you could even playlist takes. Yeah for the longest time when I started with Pro Tools and it was just like every time I wanted to try again I had to like make a new track and I just ended up with like a hundred tracks of one guitar filling up my whole screen and I didn't know where anything was it's terrible so <laughs> so worth learning this skill yeah it's it'll really clean things up for you man absolutely like I have a couple of sessions that are 15 almost yeah 15 years almost 20 years old at this point that i still have on hard drives in logic and in cubase of songs that i really enjoy some of my old bands some of my friends bands that i always had on my someday maybe list to to remix or whatever just because i i, right. I love these songs but the reason why i didn't do it aside from like not having really the time to do it but another big reason actually is that i just don't want to open up these sessions because i know how i recorded them back then and they are they are such a mess it's uh, takes all over the place no playlists no comping totally. and just if, if somebody would go through that prep it for me and I could just mix that would be awesome but like having to do that first step that is what, what keeps me from actually Big doing job. it so yeah. so <laughs> that is why please, I, I don't want you to be in the same situation a couple of years from now like don't sabotage yourself be your future self's best friend and like track everything properly do comping on the fly because then even if you decide to open up a session months or years later it's still going to make sense to you and the essence is going to be there the takes are going to be there and yeah I, I wish I, I knew that 15 years ago so yeah 100% great note yeah cool I think that's it. On that note, Malcolm, you said like um, hearing it and then seeing it applied or applying it yourself are two different things. This is one of the reasons why I highly recommend you apply for the Self-Recording Syndicate, by the way, our coaching program, because we can show you how to do that. We actually do that in the inside the, the coaching program. So one of our students actually suggested this as an action plan. We call them action plans in the, in the coaching. So he just suggested comping on the fly as a topic for an action plan. And now we created this episode, but there will be an extra plan as well with videos showing you how to do those things that we just talked about. And then, of course, we do sessions with our students where we walk them through it and show, them, show it to them in their doll and all those things. So if you want to learn more about this and how to actually do it without having to figure it out on your own, go to the selfrecordingband.com and just apply for our coaching program. We've paused registrations for now, if you're listening to this in January or early um, February. But very soon, the doors will be open again once we changed a few things to the program. And uh, then you can go, uh, you can get in again and actually learn how to do all this. Yeah. And, and uh, one more thing I want to point out is that Benny, like a crazy person, is committed <laughs> to being able to teach in any DAW. <laughs> Um, <laughs> yes, it's true. Which I don't under, I still can't wrap my head around. But uh, not not just me, so to be fair. Me and a couple of people helping me, but we do it. Yeah, 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but yeah, you know, he's gonna meet you where you are. So if you're not using like Benny's a, uh, a cube base whiz, but if you're not using that, he's still gonna be able to help you, which is amazing. Absolutely, yeah. You're probably like the only place that does that, <laughs> only education I, option. <laughs> I think I honestly think so. There's many things I think that only we do, like the whole the whole one on one attention that we give, and like the yeah, and definitely thing with the DAWs. I don't any other. I don't know of any other program that does this. So very proud of that. <laughs> and and uh, yeah, just apply for it. It's awesome. Great. Final note here, before we wrap this up, I'm going to be at NAMM in a couple of days, actually. So 10 days from now, like two, almost two, like about two weeks from now, NAMM is happening and 10 days from now, I'm going to fly from, to... From recording. Yeah. From recording. Yeah. From Sorry, from recording. Yeah. yeah. About a week from, yeah, a week from after like, when does this episode this come out? Weekend. This episode comes out like Wednesday. So yeah, a week from now, if you, if you listen to this right on Wednesday, uh, I'm already going to be in the US actually, or I'm going to just... I would probably have just arrived or whatever. And then I'm going to be in LA for about a week, go to the NAMM show, and I have a couple of days before and after NAMM. So if you are at the NAMM show or if you are in the LA area, please, please let me know. I'd love to connect. I'd love to meet. I'd love to, you know, have lunch or whatever. So I haven't been there before. I have met our listeners in Canada, like in, on, on Vancouver Island. I have met our listeners in a couple of places in Germany and Europe, but I haven't met them any of you in California or LA so I'd love to do that I'd love to meet up I'd love to connect yeah. and let me know if you are there and I can't wait to do this this is going to be great and obviously if you're at NAM or if you are part of a company or you know someone who who is there for work reasons let me know as well I'm going to just love to talk to as many people as possible there make some connections so feel free to reach out I'm going to be there all the time it's going to be very exhausting but also exciting <laughs> and I'm looking yeah. forward to that yeah. <laughs> Yeah, man, that, that, that's going to be so fun. Have a blast. And I did see that a couple of friends of the podcast. I know John McLucas is going to be there. Uh, Christian Cole is going to be there. Uh, that'll be a good crew. So for sure, we'll have Warren a very definitely good will be there as well, I think. Yeah, yeah. Warren will be there. Uh, yeah, wish I could make it for sure. Yeah, yeah, that's the bummer that you can't, you can't make it, Malcolm, but I'll do my best to next represent year. the self recording band. <laughs> yes, next year. <laughs> awesome, man. Cool. Thank you for listening, as always. Let us know if you have any questions. Comment below if you're watching on YouTube. Leave us a review. All the you know things you could do to help us reach more people would be very appreciated, very much appreciated. And talk to you next week. Bye-bye. Adios. Bye.